Welcome to The Road to Jesus with Pastor Fred here at St. James Lutheran Church in Marion, Indiana. Today we are covering um, Psalm 96 through Psalm 119 on our, uh, our Road to Jesus. Um, this isn't a lot of Psalms this week, uh, but Psalm 119 is like seven Psalms in one, so we'll be delving, delving into that Psalm a little bit more in detail. Again, um, as we talked about in previous weeks, the Psalms are the hymn book or the song book of the Bible. And if you've been praying through them, you also realize they are a great resource for that as well. So I'll kind of get started with the Psalms and go into some explanation. Let's start with Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is classified as a messianic enthronement psalm. Uh, it's a joyous psalm when you read it proclaims God's great deeds of salvation for all nations. And Psalm 97 is another messianic enthronement psalm, the psalm of joy. Uh, God's power and majesty over all creation is emphasized. And there are only two responses when that judgment comes, either one of terror because of unbelief or one of joyful thanksgiving because of faith in Christ. Psalm 98 is again another messianic enthronement song. And the main refrain here is, sing a new song, let the rivers clap their hands. Uh, this is a psalm celebrating God's mighty works for all to see. Psalm 99, again, is another messianic enthronement psalm. Uh, the Lord is king over all creation. He is holy and awesome, and which leads to reverence and fear on our part. He also talks about, making, uh, talks about Moses and Aaron and Samuel making some historical references, which some of the psalms do. And then Psalm 100 is a hymn and a psalm of descriptive praise. It's a kind of classified sometimes as a thankful doxology. Uh, it's full of joy and, that God has established Israel as his people. Psalm 101 is a messianic royal psalm. The king is God's servant, and he makes promises and demands as he leads his people under the direction of God. Psalm 102 is an individual lament. Uh, and this is a little bit of a change from the previous psalms. Uh, it is the fifth penitential psalm, uh, meaning it's one of confession and absolution. And it's in the midst of a bit, bunch of praise psalms, which is unusual a little bit. But it also ends up confessing faith in God's care and protection and talks about God's strength. Psalm 103 is a hymn, again, a psalm of descriptive praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, is a refrain that we hear in this psalm. And this psalm is kind of an introduction to the psalms of, of, uh, that go through 106, from 103 to 106, which praise God over and over and over again. And in this psalm, the weakness of man is contrasted to the power of God. Psalm 104 is a hymn of praise, of descriptive praise, also a psalm of creation. The psalmist praised God as the creator of everything. God creates and continues to care for his creation. And then Psalm 105 and 106 go together. Psalm 105 recalls God's promises to Abraham and fo focuses on God's grace. God frees his people from slavery. And Psalm 106, connected to that, is a community psalm of praise. And it starts with praise and moves to confession. The most important words here are nevertheless. In other words, no matter how much Israel has disobeyed God, he continues to keep his promises to them and save them. This is a great comfort to us as we sin against God, but he continues to to forgive us and keep us as his children. Psalm 107 is a liturgical psalm, a kind of a worship psalm. This talks about the time of restoration after they all return from the Babylonian exile. God's steadfast love is seen throughout history. And because of sin, um, we live in a hostile world. But of course, we know that Christ is our Redeemer and Savior from that. Psalm 108, this is a psalm that's good for times of stress and repeats the themes of Psalm 57 and 60. You can go back and look at those later. Uh, it talks about God's help in time of trouble. Psalm 109 is an individual lament. It's the last imprecatory psalm, uh, where you know judgment is called down on the enemies, and David calls for judgment and punishment on those who falsely accuse him. He says his enemies have removed themselves from God's grace. Psalm 110 is the messianic royal psalm quoted a lot in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it is central to the teaching of the book of Hebrews. It addresses the Lord as king. It talks about how the world is looking for a physical manifestation of God, and David is saying that prophetically, that manifestation will be one of his future descendants, namely Jesus. 
talks a lot about Melchizedek. Uh, we find Melchizedek, of course, meeting Abraham after a great battle and blessing him. And he is said to be a priest, but he's not, of course, of Levi. Uh, he has no lineage and kind of hard to figure out who exactly Melchizedek is. But it says later in Hebrews that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Because Jesus, of course, is not from the tribe of Levi, Levi, where the priests come, but from the tribe of Judah. But he is an eternal priest. Um, and so this thing, uh, Psalm 110 and that Melchizedek thing, is going to play a lot if you're reading through the book of, of Hebrews. As a matter of fact, it's kind of almost impossible to understand the book of Hebrews without Psalm 110. Psalm 111 is a wisdom psalm, a hymn, a hymn of descriptive praise. This is a psalm that praises God's works. Luther really liked this psalm and said the words, the Lord is gracious and merciful from verse 4, should be painted in golden letters around the portrait of the Lord's Supper. Psalm 112, wisdom psalm, focused on the person who fears the Lord because of his great works. The fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. Psalm 113, hymn of descriptive praise, one of the Hala psalms sung during the Passover meal and festivals. These are Psalms 113 through 118. So these, when the Passover meal was happening, the festivals, these Psalms 113 through 118 were were sung. Uh, Remember we talked about how a lot of the Psalms fit in various places in the worship service uh, of the the, uh, temple and the synagogue. And this one is a general call to praise. The Lord is exalted on high, who reaches down low with his salvation. Psalm 114 um, is the only um, Hallah song pointing back the Exodus, pointing out that God will rescue the needy. And Psalm 115 says, Do not look at the outward manifestations of strength like idol worshipers, but remember God's steadfast love. God calls people to the realization of the truth of his existence. Psalm 116, individual, individual lament, and also a psalm of praise. The Lord is the deliverer, and the psalmist expresses his love for him. Psalm 117 is a hymn of descriptive praise. This is the shortest psalm in the Bible, and it celebrates God's love. God's steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 118, a liturgical psalm, okay, offers thanks to God for national deliverance and anticipates the life of Christ. Uh, psalm 119 is a wisdom psalm, the longest psalm in the Bible by far, right? thought of as the great psalm of the word, praise for the right understanding of God's law and word. The word is a lamp to my feet. The central thing is studying God's word and his law and meditating on it, putting our trust in the word of God to show us God and his way and to lead us to living a Christ-centered life. Um, This psalm is throughout um, the church here. It's a psalm of parts of it, a psalm of the day. It's, of course, a lot a lot of the introits and graduals and stuff like that as well. A psalm that we, we use quite a lot. Uh, looking at Psalm 119 in more depth, we discover that there are eight words that get repeated over and over again throughout the psalm that they're kind of related to it. And these words are used together sometimes to complement one another or to more fully explain one another. For instance, there's the word law. Now, uh, the way it's used in 119 is that it means instruction or direction, includes God's commandments, also includes the proclamation of the gospel. So it's a broad use of the law. Now let me explain that. Normally when we say law, we're talking about God's commands as opposed to, for instance, the gospel. We talk about law and gospel. You know, uh, the law shows our sins, the gospel shows us our Savior. But the law can also be mean, used to mean the entire word of God. And so in a broad sense, instead of just the law. The gospel can also be used that way to include the law. Normally, though, we use it in the narrow sense. There's the law and there's the gospel. But in this psalm, many times when it's talking about the law, it's just talking about the word of God in itself. Um, And also, you know, sometimes the law is referred to as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So when we use that term law, you've got to be careful exactly the way it's being used. So in, in this sense, it's a broad sense. Another word is testimonies. And, and what these are, they are witnesses of the covenant. And also include things like the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which were put in the Ark of the Covenant. And all those different things, the rock things they built, stacking rocks, whatever they built was a testimony. And these are testimony to future generations as to what God has done for them and what he's promised to keep doing. Another word is precepts. And these are things deserving attention. Basically, 
indicating that each of God's teaching from His Word is a precept deserving our attention. You know, pay attention to His precepts. Again, that goes in with those words of testimonies and, and law. Next word is statutes, closely related to precepts. That these things are written as decrees, um, kind of like they're being engraved on tablets. They're of great importance. The statutes of the Lord, um, you know, uh, gives a little bit more gravity, I guess, than precepts, but um, kind of means the same thing. Then we have commandments, obviously, and these they are things that are commanded or commissioned um, by the Lord. Um, and then rules. So we got commandments, law, precepts, statutes, and then we got rules. Another word for judgments. It's kind of a legal term for decisions rendered by a judge. Sometimes it can uh, indicate um, good things or bad things. It can indicate, you know, condemnation, or it can indicate a pronouncement of justification by God as a judge because of, of faith in Christ. So it can, um, you know, the rules of, of God. They're not necessarily bad, bad at times. Word is the next one, word. It means spoken, when we think about the word. God spoke those things that are his words. He spoke things into existence. He spoke life. Uh, we go back to Genesis and see that. And uh, uh, promises is the last one we run into throughout Psalm 119. These are sayings or commands or a promise that doesn't just include the promise, but also the fulfillment of that promise. So there isn't just the promise is given, along with that promise is given the the fulfillment of it, or the, that we know it's going to be fulfilled. So it isn't just, well, we hope he comes through. It's like, no, he says promises. We also think, well, it's been fulfilled. Um, what we see in these words is that God's word, as defined in Psalm 119 and other places, is more than rules to follow, but that God gives life to his word. Uh, we read the phrase, according to God's word. A lot in Psalm 119. And that word of God produces life, it gives hope, it gives forgiveness and salvation. In the New Testament, of course, the word becomes flesh in Jesus Christ. Um, so this is a great psalm as we go through um, and look at what it says about God's law, sometimes indicating the gospel, it says about God's love and compassion for us, and how we're to use the word of God to, to um, understand what, um, what God has done for us, and also um, how to keep our path clear and how to keep you know, following the will of God. Next week, we'll be covering Psalms 120 through Proverbs 8. So we're going to finish um, up through 150, the Psalms, then go into Proverbs. And we'll talk about the Psalms of Ascent and Worship, which, of course, happened during the, some of the festivals and what, what that meant. Um, now, we're also going to talk about Proverbs, which is interesting because um, Proverbs are wisdom sayings or Things about wisdom, but also guidance in life. You know, how does a young man keep his way pure? And I heard uh, uh, one of the professors one time say at a conference recently that, you know, I never really liked the Proverbs because um, they just seemed so self-evident, right? It just made sense that you would do those things. But in the world that we live in today with all the craziness, uh, maybe we need to go back to the Proverbs and really take a good look because what, we, what the Proverbs has is common sense well, flies in the face of everything that we see going on in our culture today. So Proverbs might be a pretty good book to, to spend some time in. Um, you wouldn't think we need them, but I think we, we probably do need them. So next week we'll complete uh, the book of Psalms and start into the book of Proverbs, which I think uh, you will enjoy. They're a little different than the Psalms, uh, um, have a different approach. So, well, thank you for joining us for um, The Road to Jesus with Pastor Fred here at St. James Lutheran Church in Marion, Indiana. And we will see you next week. Peace out.